because that is the power of Taylor Swift and other big artists and a subsequent risk to consider when investing in the music business, because in theory, any artist can re-record a music recording that they were famous for 10 years prior. They don't own the rights to that particular, that specific recording. And then they can re-record, put their own little spin on it so it's not exactly the same. And then if they find it a distributor, they can then release that music and make money on it. The best part about this, because you brought this up to me in the car and I was sitting down having dinner with these two really big T-Swiss fans, <laughs> right when I said, hey, did you know that there's a recording of like Taylor Swift recording? She, they're like, uh-huh, and that's what we listen to. <laughs> and it's like... Welcome to Critical Thinking Required, hosted by LBW. This podcast is intended for free thinkers, entrepreneurs, and knowledge seekers. Join us as we discuss relevant financial topics, explore with guests their financial journeys, and engage with experts in industries such as space, media and entertainment, real estate, and many more. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to Critical Thinking Required. You're with your hosts, myself, Tim Bickmore, and my colleague, Nathaniel Leach. And if anybody's been listening to our podcast for the last few, few years, whenever I have Nathaniel on here with me, we're talking about one thing and one thing only, and that's investing or something investing related. And today we are actually going to talk about music. Nathaniel has been doing some research on the music industry, specifically on a few different companies. And we want to talk a little bit about it. It's pretty nuanced. It's quite interesting. We thought our listeners might be interested in hearing some thoughts about this specific industry because we all, well, I would say the most of us, most of us seem to be listening to music at some point in time, be it classical, rock, rap, doesn't matter. We listen to a lot of music and Nathaniel that interests him because it can be timeless potentially. So Nathaniel, for today, what we really want to know first and foremost is what is the difference between music recording and music publishing? That's actually a really great question, Tim, because at first, when I first came across this, I was thinking, well, Aren't they one and the same, right? I but, assume so. It, right, but but they're actually not. So the music recording is what you hear on the final product. So when I pop in a CD or when I listen to a song on Spotify or Pandora, that recording is what's called a music recording. And that is a whole different revenue model than music publishing. Music hmm. publishing consists of the ownership of the composition of the song, which consists of the uh, the, the songwriting, the, the, the sorry songwriting, composition, the lyrics of okay. the song. And, and then the music recording is the artist singing that Their song. Published song. That's right. It's publishing. Yep. So really quick, I got I got two small um questions about that. So okay. to, to clarify for the audience. So for example, let's say that someone wants to cover a song. Mm. Really what they're doing is they're recording mm. the song, which could be its own revenue stream, but then they're probably paying the artist for, for covering their published lyrics and music composition. Correct. So you can get paid for other people to sing your song. Correct. Okay. Now I want to bring this up because you brought it up to me the other day when, when we were driving and these are for all the T-Swift fans out there. Please <laughs> give the example of this specifically about Taylor Swift, which by the way, I asked some tweet T-Swift fans about this specifically Oh, okay. and they do listen <laughs> to the T-Swift recording. Yeah, they do <laughs> specifically. So please explain now you'll, the audience will understand this once the thing gets it. Please explain. I think it gives a very good example of the difference between recording and publishing. Right. Okay. So a few years ago, Taylor Swift was coming up on the time where she was renewing her contract with uh, her uh, music label. And her music label had subsequently come to be owned by Universal Music Group, or UMG for short. And during the negotiations, uh, Taylor alleged that she had made an offer 
for the masters of her recordings. So what that means is that the when she first started out, she wrote a deal with her label and she most likely signed away complete ownership or a, a majority of ownership to whatever was recorded in the studios, which is the music recording. And she alleged that during these contract negotiations, that she had made an offer to buy her masters. Now, this is significant because every time her recording is played, that creates a royalty to be paid to the owner of those uh, music recordings, those masters. And I think that she wanted to receive those royalties, 100% of those royalties. It was her music. She she wanted to make it a play. She wanted to uh, offer to buy those masters. And she alleges that she was turned down. The music label uh, said that was not true um, and, and or or something of that nature. And, and she didn't get her masters. She did not subsequently come to own her masters. So... <laughs> So Taylor uh, gave a, a big, big finger to the, the labels and said, fine, I'm going to re-record those songs, but I'm going to own those masters of those new recordings. Now, she could do that because even though she didn't own the music recordings, she owned the publishing. She had created those songs. She had written those lyrics. Once she sang those lyrics and, and played that music and recorded it, she then came up with a new music recording, a new master. And she, I think she did certain things differently with perhaps, uh, so it wasn't exactly the same as the original music recording. Hence, there was no uh, copyright or IP infringement. And she has subsequently released those new recordings. And what Tim said before I got into this was freaking fascinating because that is the power of Taylor Swift and other big artists and a subsequent risk to consider when investing in the music business. Because in theory, any artist can re-record a music recording that they were famous for 10 years prior. They don't own the rights to that particular, that specific recording. And then they can re-record, put their own little spin on it so it's not exactly the same. And then if they find a distributor, they can then release that music and make money on it. So this has created a very interesting dynamic within the music industry in the sense that the large music groups, which are comprised of Universal Music Group, Warner Music Group and uh, Sony Music, which is a part of the larger Sony conglomerate, it has caused a shift in the power dynamic between artists and these music groups, such that the music groups used to own these masters outright when the artists would typically first start out. And that made sense because the music groups would usually front a large amount of money to the artist mm -hmm. also produce the masters and would then uh, subsequently be responsible for distributing and marketing the new content. And they were taking on the risk. So that made sense. But now with the ability of artists, if, if they're big enough, then these large artists now have more power, more leverage to to uh, recreate what they what made them famous in the first place and subsequently distribute it to their fans. And so the best part about this, because you brought this up to me in the car and I was sitting down having dinner with these two really big T-Swiss fans, <laughs> right when I said, hey, did you know that there's a recording of like Taylor Swift's recording? She, they're like, uh-huh, and that's what we listen to. <laughs> and it's like they know about it. So her fans are, you know, they're supporting her. And yep. it's just a fascinating that I had never, I did, I'm not a huge T-Swift fan, so I had no idea until you brought it up. But I, I did a little, you know, quote unquote market research. And I was like, dang, yeah, she's she's working it. She is. Which is fascinating. So the shift, I guess not shift gears, but you've kind of hit on it a little bit earnings like right where is the earning potential where mm -hmm. is it you know what's going on could you explain to us 
I guess specifically with maybe Universal Media Group or UMG, like where are the earnings coming from? Like in the past, where is it now? What's going on? Sure. So I think that most people are mindful of, of that the music industry went through a some pretty serious cycles in the, in the recent 20 to 30 years. So in the past, it was the, the selling of, of vinyl records. They then shifted to tapes and other mediums and then CDs. And then Napster happened. So they have been ever since dealing with piracy, even yeah. to this day. But uh, what has subsequently happened in the last decade or so is this concept of streaming. So at first it was Apple Music offering uh, songs for 99 cents per song. Uh, but over time, that model has shifted to streaming uh, in the sense that you pay a subscription or you um, you get access for free, but you have to listen to ads and you can then stream as many songs as you want. You no longer have to pay per song. And, and now you can sit in the comfort of your own home Whereas before you would have to go to the record store, you'd have to buy the CD, you'd have to then take it home, you then have to listen to it in, in a specific order. You could skip around, but it wasn't relatively easy to do. Now you can just sit at home, click a button, and you have access to all of this music. You can listen to an album in any order you so choose. You can have choose to have it shuffled. You can do many different things uh, in the privacy of your home or, or in the car on your way to your commute. Or, or also in the subway or on the train, the bus, and you can listen to music anywhere. Which is quite impressive, actually. If you, now the way that you kind of laid that out from a historical perspective, that's been a huge change relatively fast, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, Spotify has been around since when? 20, I don't know. 2008, 2007, I want to say. Okay. All right. So it hasn't been around for that long. So that's no. change in the industry. And I'm mm -hmm. assuming that's affected. Affected artists to a certain degree, probably also labels to a certain oh, degree, which yep. goes back to the recordings and all this, obviously also publishing mm -hmm. um, as well, which is quite interesting. And we could, there's so many rabbit holes in what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> there's just so many different ways you can go about it. We'll keep it at that. I think it's a good high level understanding. Mm -hmm. So now I want to kind of hit, like we talked a little bit about, hey, recording versus publishing, where our earnings come from. So if you are going to invest in this industry mm. and already you just said, hey, Tim, there's a lot of rabbit holes. So this seems like it's multi-layered, right? There, mm. There's complexities to this, right? Nuance. Right. So if you were to invest, right, you have artists, the producing company, the recording companies, you have publishing companies. Where would you want to invest? Like, what are you trying to find? I guess I would want to put it in the context of this. A lot of people say the gold rush was great, but you didn't want to be the person mining for gold. Mm. You wanted to be supplying the shovels to the miners or mm. the Levi's to the miners. Is there something like that in the music industry where you're not mining the gold, but supporting the cast or how does that work? Where would you want to go? So where I, well, first of all, before we get into the, the minutia, um, I, this is not investment advice. So yeah. just keep that in mind, right? This is just us going down a couple of rabbit holes when it comes to the music Skin business. What what, what makes us what makes it interesting to us? So if if I were to approach what what really makes this interesting is that there are a few companies which I actually already listed, which are essentially what I would call the music rights facilitators. And I say facilitators and not owners because they don't necessarily own the uh, music recordings or the music publishing rights to all of the music that they distribute. They, they essentially lease most of it. And then every once in a while, it comes up for contract negotiations with a particular artist where they then ink a new deal with the artist. And it depends on the artist. So the three music groups that I, I mentioned real quick are Universal Music Group, Warner Music Group, and then Sony Music. And this would be more like either more not because or like I don't want to call them patent trolls, but in a sense, they're they're asset managers. They're managing a bunch of assets and then like why that's why you kind of mentioned facilitating it. They have owned the rights to it and then they're releasing it or really releasing those content over time. It's a mix of all of that. Yes, yeah. um, I, I, they're they help, as I said, they they help. Um, they're like VCs. They're like venture capital firms, essentially, because they're they're spreading their net wide, uh, almost in worldwide in most mm -hmm. cases. They're they're growing uh, through developing countries, 
and they are making investments in artists that come to their attention. And in return, with these new artists, they're typically requiring ownership, a, per a percentage of ownership, depending on the artists and their respective leverage, to uh, own a portion of what they help create. Yep. So they're responsible for these lar three large groups are responsible for finding talent, then subsequently investing in the talent by giving them uh, royalty advances uh, in, in, in advance of the music that is to be produced. These companies are typically then responsible for or, or um, investing in the artist by um, producing the music. So that's the investment that paying the engineers, the, the sound engineers, all other aspects of that to produce the music. Uh, and then they they publish the music that is on on CDs, digital uh, on digital platforms such as Spotify, Pandora, etc. And and then they uh, market the content, the, the the completed content, and then they distribute it uh, through said set, through said platforms as well. That is as close as one can get to the ownership of the music. Mm without actually being the artist yourself. Gotcha. There, there are actually private investment um, companies out there that are investing in content or trying to attain ownership of those music rights. There's been a, a number of deals mentioned in the past few years. Uh, Bob Dylan sold his, his um, catalog. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, catalogs, yeah. Yep. And uh, Sting, in 2022, sold his catalog as well. Was Prince also potentially? I don't remember. Maybe that's doing the estate sale, but possibly. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was fascinating about Sting, as an example, actually, is using the Taylor Swift story that we mentioned. Uh, in my mind, it would be difficult for Sting to go back to his work 40 years ago and attempt to re-record that music because his voice would not sound the same. It change. changes with age. So Taylor Swift was very unique in that she started when she was 15. Yeah. Like she got her first record deal, I think. She's now 30? Somewhere around. Right. There. She's she's still relatively young. She still doesn't. There's definitely been changes in her voice, but it was very easy for her to replicate her original work. But you asked Sting to do that 40 years later. Like that kind of risk, it's not too much of a risk. So it depends on the artist. It depends on how large the artist's popularity is, Makes sense. et cetera. So, uh, yeah, as, this is as qu close as you can get to the, to the music, to the ownership of the music rights without actually being an artist. It's going to be either a private investment group or it's going to be uh, one of these big three music groups. Or if you happen to have uh, the ability to invest in, in, in labels, music labels. Gotcha. Well. But those are that's hard to do. Whereas Universal, Warner, Sony, they actually own pieces of ownership in tens, if not hundreds, of that's music right. labels. So so-called independent music labels, some of them aren't so independent. If they all funnel back up, economies of scale at the end of the day. Yep. So what about this idea of acting as a middleman? Like, how do you supply Spotify, Apple? Like, is that Universal going to Spotify and releasing their content that they they own like how does that work so it works like this so um universal music or umg umg uh acts as the facilitator for taylor swift or drake i think is one of their artists as well and they uh, uh, allow for they make the deal on behalf of those artists with spotify and they come out with a deal for how much spotify is going to pay universal for access to their clients music hmm. and then spotify then turns around and sells it to you and me and then there's at least a few hundred worldwide spotify's they're not necessarily of spotify size but there's a, a few hundred different distribution digital do di excuse me there are a few hundred digital music platforms out there just like spotify that Universal makes these specific deals with. Interesting. Okay. All right. That's really interesting about like the platforms, how Universal kind of puts those deals together. Mm. Now, I think we got time for one more question. I don't know if you're going to like this one. I'm going to like it. 
But let's talk about AI. <laughs> people can clone voices. People can clone music. Mm -hmm. How is that level of piracy, I guess, to a certain degree? How is that? That's a whole new environment, a whole new path mm -hmm. that we have never seen just due to the technological advances that some of this machine learning and, and artificial intelligence has brought. Yeah. So uh, it, it is a risk to artists, for sure. It's in my mind, it's akin to uh, the potential risk of piracy in that it's going to be hard to to police that uh, these these music groups do have huge pockets. So uh, and they are very adept at protecting their legal and their artists legal rights. So there is that. But when it comes to AI, it could be uh, an opportunity for some artists to take advantage of. Uh, one artist that comes to mind is that uh, a couple months ago, I think it was, the artist Grimes uh, had, did an, a news article, I think. She was in a, a news and she said that she was willing to share any proceeds from any song created with AI that used her voice. So it works out essentially that anybody who um, wrote the song and that is the, the lyrics, the composition, they would receive 50 percent of the proceeds. And she, because it's her voice, would receive the other 50 percent. Interesting. So it could be a potential play where uh, music artists could uh, still reap the benefits because it is, in fact, their voice that an AI voice is being created from, and therefore they should be compensated for their voice. So here's a quick question for you. I'm going to loop this all the way back in. Sting, mm -hmm. could he take his voice from 40 years ago and re-record his songs using AI? But okay, well, let's let's break that down. So if you're saying could they, could somebody, could he take his music recording and then create AI from that to then recreate that original recording. He can't because IP because he doesn't. Oh, he no longer owns that recording. Uh, I'm not even sure who owns the recording to be honest. But if he doesn't own that recording, then he can't use, use that the, recording the... without paying a royalty for the use of that recording to then create the AI. But I guess so that means he could. So I'm just kind of spitting yeah, yeah. here. Let's say that he was interviewed and he had a, a lot of different, Ooh. you know, yeah, other music outside of those recordings to recreate his voice from that era and then re recorded his songs. But think about who owns those yeah, recordings true, yeah. of those I don't know. I don't know. videos, right? It's not him. It's going to be the, the news organizations that recorded that video. Maybe we just, hey, any artists, just start recording yourself. You that is actually know. what Grimes said. She actually said that she wished that she had kept recordings of her voice uh, when she first started out mm. to then create AI from that. But she she didn't think to, to do that. So anybody today who is making songs should also be making recordings uh, of their own that they own. Uh, so that perhaps that voice can then be used in the future. I mean, if you think about it, they could just sing notes, like sing all the notes that they mm -hmm. hit, and then AI would just put those notes together. And yep, wow, that's kind of crazy. To think it's about. it's crazy, and it's definitely a risk yeah. that one uh, has. I mean, th it, it's these kinds of risks that we have to think of yeah. as investors. Yeah, because some of these things they might sound like. Like a year ago, this was this wasn't even a thing. It was. I mean, with the, with the the six months ago, right? With the advent of OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT, this is clearly this was already present before. Like we, yeah, but the it, mainstream it, didn't yeah. know about it, right? It was finally put into the public. Correct. Yep. Very interesting. Oh, I'm glad we ended on that one because mm. it's a really yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, it's an interesting one to think about. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, do, I'm gonna let. Do you want me to go first? Any like final thoughts? After you. Um, 
I always like doing these podcasts and Nathaniel, he always brings up some interesting stuff. I honestly, I just love the T-Swift thing. I have no <laughs> idea. Just such, that's such a Isn't boss it move. It's such a boss. Like, hey, guess what? She's got the, the hat. Clout. She's yeah. got the, the clout. Yeah, she can do it. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and again, that's not every artist and every artist has to start from somewhere, but she, I guess, earned the right to be able to, to kind of throw that weight around, which she's got the fans. Yeah, is crazy. That's just it was a really cool. And then to ask, you know, and they immediately were like, "Oh yeah, that's what we listen to." I'm like, "Oh, and they love this. Oh, it's great." Um, yeah. But yeah, that's really my 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 big I guess thought is like the T Swift thing is fascinating and the nuance to this industry. Mm-hmm. I didn't quite grasp until you started telling me about. It. I'm like, "Oh yeah, mm-hmm. there is a lot." And I know we didn't talk about this, but Nathaniel did mention the the difference between film or TV huh. versus music and the potential timelessness that music does have. I mean, you know, we we listen to Bach and Be- Beethoven. I mean, those are hundreds of years old and people still listen to it mm-hmm. religiously, um, you know, depending if you like that type of music. Right. But the, the copyright does lapse after a certain period of time. Yeah. So like classical music, there is no... Yeah. Well, is, yeah, but the the overall just idea that yeah. that's how long something can last mm-hmm. is is quite crazy to think about, and how it will kind of come in and out, similar to I guess fashion, right? Like mm-hmm. you know, nineties rock will come back, and then it will fall, and then it's nineties mm-hmm. rap, and then you know, two thousands, and it's trap, and so this idea that it, you can have a timeless effect where TV series could be of the times, could mm-hmm. be representative of the times, but. And yes, you're going to have your cult classics. You're going to have your your classic shows. But right. music, I feel, is a little bit more, can be a little bit more timeless, which it was just a fascinating that you brought that up and made the comparison. I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess that's mm-hmm. true. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so it was just, I, I loved it. What do you got? That's all I have. I, I just want to touch on that. It's This is just one snippet of my, what how we think about things. It, 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 there are so many other different points of view that we have to consider When we are researching companies, we have to factor in where does this company sit within its industry? Where does the industry fit at large, the AI risk, for example? And then where are who are all the different players and how do they work together? And who has more leverage than the other? And this is just one microism of what we do. And the reason why I'm saying that is because it's fun. It's fun to to do this kind of research because there's so many different areas where you can go, but you also then have to be mindful of your limitations. And you have to know when you've reached that limitation, we always talk about the circle of competence. You have to know when you've reached the edge of your circle of competence, because once you breach that, you then risk uh, you, you and your clients' money. Yep. And what's, you know, I, I, I'm sorry to add on, but <laughs> we do have some clients in the music industry and they mm-hmm. would be able to understand that nuance because they experience it, they understand it, they've done the deals, they know how it works, they mm-hmm. know the back and they know the incentives, what are the true underlying incentives. And that's typically where we push people who are in that and say, hey, if you want to invest in it, that's okay because you, you understand the risk. Yep. Um, which kind of goes back obviously to the circle of competence, which is also uh, fun. Mm-hmm. So, well, awesome. Well, Danny, thank you for your, your uh, comments on music and thank you everybody for listening. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And for all those T Swift fans, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much. Like, like and subscribe. Thank you for taking the time to start your journey of thinking differently and listening to LBW talk about stuff they love until next time.